that we're beginning a new series called uh, Painting the Target. What's that all about, Painting the Target? Well, I just wanted to let you know a few things about prayer. We're going to be talking about prayer, and we're using this as an illustration. If you're not familiar what happens, in, in warfare, you usually you have the Air Force, right, the ground troops, and then you have the sea. And in order to win a war, you need both. And in many ways, we're going to be talking about that today. How can our prayers be pinpointed to make a difference? So what will happen is, if you have uh, ground troops and they see a target that they want to get, what they'll do is sometimes they'll have a laser and they'll, point, they'll paint the laser on the target. You can't see it, sometimes a laser, but the, uh, the, either the helicopter or the aircraft can see it. And so it launches its missile and the missile will go where that target is painted. So I wanted to show you a little illustration of what that looks like. Loud and clear, Easy Rhino. Do we have a gig? Over. That's a Raj. Start the music. Into attack. Pickles hot. Target is acquired and lift. Coming down. <laughs> I'm not inciting violence, okay? <laughs> so I want to show you that, in a way, that's kind of what prayer is like. What we want to do is this. We, we don't have the missiles. We don't have the launchers. But what we do have, we're ground troops, right? And God has given us a mission to do. He said, I want you to occupy the land I have for you. And what we can do often at times, we pray about circumstances and asking God to move on our behalf. And we, what we do is we can paint a target. In other words, find something you're painting. Maybe it's a situation. Maybe it's a marriage Maybe it's a job. Maybe it's a boyfriend or girlfriend you're going through. Maybe it's a college you're trying to get into. Maybe it's something you're trying to get rid of or get some more of. Maybe you're trying to get into a school or a job or whatever you're going through. And it, it, what it's doing is it's like painting a target and saying, God, I need you to work in my behalf. Now, we're going to explain what that looks like a little bit more in a few moments and what that means. And so what it really is is that we, we are triune beings, and we're, we're both body, soul, and spirit. Not only that, but we're going to be talking about that we are in a spiritual realm. Even though we're in the physical realm, there's a spiritual realm that is going on, which we will talk about in a few moments. So paint the target. I want to bring your attention to a story in the Bible, a true story in the Bible, with Moses and the Israelites. If you don't know who Moses and the Israelites are, it's fine. Moses was a great deliverer, and the Israelites were in captivity in Egypt for 400 years. God raised up a deliverer by the name of Moses, okay? Now, Moses was also a slave, but Pharaoh's daughter saw him as a little baby because the mother tried to protect him from being killed, and she raised him as her son. But as he became about 40 years old, he saw some of his own people, the Hebrews, that were being abused. So he took matters in his own hands, and he killed an Egyptian. Word got back to Pharaoh, and they tried to kill him. He was a fugitive. So everything he had, his Harvard education, if you will, all his education, his pedigree, living in the palace, he left it all, and he went to the backside of a desert for 40 years. 40 years old, then he's 80 years old, and God speaks to him at a burning bush. 80 years old, okay? He says, I want you to go back to your shame, and I want you to deliver the people. He failed royally, pun intended. And, and God called him and says, who am I? And so, and, and what happened was, while he was sitting there, he had a shepherd's staff. And just to let everyone know, I don't know if you're familiar with Egypt, Egyptian culture back in that day, but e uh, Egyptians hated shepherds. It was a, a low-life job, okay? It was one of the worst jobs. One of the, ever hear those, that TV program, Dirty Jobs? Yeah, it was one of those things, all right? And uh, so he's sitting at the, uh, or standing at the mountain, God speaking to him, 
And God says, I'm going to call you. He says, who am I, God? He says, what's in your hand? He says, a shepherd's staff, my shame. So I want you to do something. What do you want you to do? I want you to throw it down. So he throws it down, and it turns into a snake. And God, it turns from Moses' shame becomes God's power in his hands. And the good news is this. Whatever you've done in your past, if you're willing to let it go, God can take your past, even bad things that have happened, and he can change it to be something he can minister powerfully through. We have a dear friend of ours. Her name is Patty Height. She's been here a couple times, and she was, uh, gr- grew up molested and was, very, uh, was in a same-sex relationship for a number of years, and then she gave her life to Christ. She realized it was the wrong way to go. God delivered her out of that, and now she's got a ministry called Out of Egypt Ministry. She's come here twice, and she helps churches and other people get free of the confusion of sexual identity. And she does it in a life-giving way. So what her shame was, what her difficulty was, God took it and used it. I know people that are on drugs and now have tremendous ministries to help people get off drugs. I know people that have gone through bereavements and difficulties. And so do not discount what God can do. God can take your shame, and I don't mean to make it rhyme, but I can't help myself because I'm a pastor. God will take your shame and make it a gain. Okay? So it's just a wonderful thing that God can do. And this is what God did with Moses. Okay, I'll just bring you context. Now, within, within that context, they're out of Egypt. Now they are facing the promised land. What happens prior to this passage of Scripture is uh, the people start to complain. How many of you uh, like to go on road trips with little kids? Okay? Uh, there's, there's a universal phrase, no matter where you go around the world. I've been there. I was running on a donkey one time, and the boy went, bad, 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 bad. and I said, what do you say? He's asking us if we're there yet. So no matter where you go, it, they say, are we there yet, right? So imagine, you got, you got uh, 600,000 men or a couple million people. We're not quite sure the exact amount. And they're asking Moses, are we there yet? Okay, and, and if you're like a parent, you know how frustrating that can get when the kids whine in the back seat, right? It, it's okay for the first couple of stops, but after a while, maybe you're different than I am. But nevertheless... Uh, that's before they had iPhones and all that kind of fun stuff. Anyhow, so what happened was they're complaining. They're complaining. Take us back to Egypt. We hate this. We can't stand this. Uh, there's nothing to eat. So God gives them food, gives them manna. Then he gives them quail. The next thing they start complaining, there's nothing to drink. So God, uh, Moses takes his staff, and God's staff, he says, I want you to strike the rock. He strikes the rock. Water comes out. Okay, things are getting better. Now you think, whew, we're out of the, you know, we got the, we got the meat. We got the potatoes, <laughs> we got the water, we got the meat, we got all these things we got, we got water, we're on our way. Then an enemy comes against them. The Amalekites come against them. You have to understand that the Israelites were slaves for 400 years. They have no idea how to fight. Okay, so now you have untrained soldiers going against a trained army. So it's like one thing after another, here we go again. This is terrible. Bring us back to Egypt. Okay, so this is the context. Now we come to this passage in Exodus 17. <clears throat> Excuse me. Then Amalek came and fought with Israel and referenced them. So Moses said to Joshua, excuse me real quick. <clears throat> Moses said to Joshua, choose for us men to go out and fight with Amalek. Now understand, Joshua, this is the first time we see him in the scriptures. Joshua was uh, Moses' successor. And that's the first time we see him. Also, this is the first battle that the Israelites had to face. So he says, he chose Joshua. I want you to go down and fight with Amalek. Okay, I thought God gave us this land. Why do we have to fight for? You see, God gives us things, but we have to work with him. So that's what happens, all right? Tomorrow, this is Moses speaking, I will stand at the top of the hill with the staff of God. Isn't that cool? My shame is now called the staff of God in my hand. This is what I'm gonna do, he says. Okay, so Joshua did as Moses told him, and fought with Amalek, while Moses, Aaron, his brother, and Hur. Now, Hur is not a girl, okay? Hur is a guy. I'm going to ask, I'm just give you a little advice. If you have a baby, don't call the son Hur. It's him. If I offended you, get over yourself. Okay, while Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. So what happened was Moses was basically praying. That's what he was doing. He was praying. And so he lifted his staff like this, and he was praying, hands in the air, praying over the people. All right? That's the context of it. 
whenever Moses held up his hand, Israel prevails. He's like, this, they start prevailing. And whenever he lowered his hand, getting tired. He gets tired of, oh, I was getting tired. And when he lowered his hand, Amalek prevails. He's like, okay, oh, I got to keep this up. So he kept praying. So what was he doing? He was painting the target. He was painting the Amalekites. Lord God, give him victory in Jesus' name. Of course, he didn't know who Jesus was back in those days, but Lord, give him victory. So he's sitting there praying, right? And he's getting tired. Have you ever gotten tired of praying for something? I mean, you've been praying for so many years, and God, what's going on? This is what was going on with Moses, all right? So why the lifting of hands? What's the deal with the lifting of hands? I grew up Presbyterian, and I went to one of these weird churches where they had drums on the stage, and people like to move around, and kind of weird. And they used to have these things called transparencies. You, you, you don't know what that is, do you? It's not a, it's not a, not a get-go, okay? It, it, a transparency was basically what it is. It's a piece of plastic. You put it on an overhead projector, and you put things on the, on the screen. We used to call it church that's off the wall. <laughs> so we've come a long way, baby, right? So people are sitting there raising their hands. This is weird, man. This is, but I kind of liked it, even though it was weird. And, uh, and so I grew up that way, and I always thought, you know, that's not me. I'm, I'm more of a thinker. I'm not an emotional person. If I go to a ball game, my hands are in my pocket, unless the Yankees are playing. And uh, so I didn't think much of it. But what, what's the deal with lifting of hands? Why, why do people lift their hands? I think they're so spiritual. And so I struggled with it initially until I began to read Scripture. Because it says in 1 Timothy 2.8, in every place of worship, is this in every place? Yep. I want men... To pray, it excludes women, I want men to pray with holy hands lifted up to God. Why? Why is God asking us to lift his hands? Does it mean I'm more spiritual than you? No. It's a posture. When you meet someone, you have a communication, you look them in the eyes, right? You shake someone's hand. There's something about a, a posture to receive. And so God's asking us to lift our hands because you know what it is? It's an international sign of surrender. Your hands, your right hand represented your strength. So you're saying, God, I'm lifting my hands to you. I'm giving my strength to you. I don't have what it takes, but you do. So I'm lifting my hands to receive from you. And so it became a form of worship that God has asked us to do. It's not a command, but it's an, it's an ask, right? So I want every men with holy hands lifted to God, free from anger and controversy, So which is a good thing. All right? Lift up your hands, it says in the Psalm. There's a bunch of other places, by the way. I'm just showing you two. Lift up your hands in the sanctuary. Is this a sanctuary? Yeah. And praise the Lord. So I want to I wanna double dog dare you to begin to worship God. Don't worry about people around you. I'm going to lift my hands. Father, I don't know what this means. But you know what I started to do? I went to a church one time, and I'm looking there. They're playing the song. I'm looking around. Oh, this is nice. I started doing the TV set, holding the TV set, right? Then finally I got to the field gold, all right? So, but there's something about it. I, I, please, we're not trying to demonstrate I'm more spiritual. And don't be sitting there like, they're not lifting their hands. No, don't do that, please. Don't judge each other. It's an opportunity just to say, God, I, I lift my hands to you. I surrender. And there's something special that happens. So with that being said, here you have Moses' hands are lifted. But man, it's growing weary. If you lift your hands too long, you know what I'm talking about. If you're trying to do something, all of a sudden your shoulder starts killing you. Like, ah. Even though it's light, it's hard to do. So Moses' hands grew weary. Have you ever got tired of praying for something? I mean, I've been praying for this person for five years. I, I've been praying about this situation, God. I'm asking to get free of, of, of alcohol. I'm trying to get free of anger or worry. I'm trying to get free of the situation. I've been praying for my, my long-lost girlfriend or boyfriend. I've been praying for my husband or my wife. I've been praying for my parents uh, I've been praying to, to do better in school. I've been trying to get into that college. I've been praying and praying and praying, and it seems to get worse. So what's the use anyhow? Prayer does not change God. It prayer changes me. I'm not being changed. That's, by the way, that's not true all the way. We'll talk about that. So you get tired. You grow weary. You grow weary. So they took a stone and put it under him. What does a stone represent? By the way, this is a real event that took place. And the amazing thing about the Bible it historically took place, but God also sets these situations up as object lessons to teach us lessons. So even though it happened literally, it also is, um, uh, it teaches us things as an illustration as well. So what did Moses do? He was tired. What did he do? He sat on the rock. What did Jesus say? Come to me, those who are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. God wants us to rest on his promises. So he's holding these things up. 
He's getting tired. He can't barely do it. So what happens? He put under him and he sat on it while Aaron and Hur held up his hands, one on one side and one on the other. So he's sitting there. I can't do this anymore. I'm trying to pray for these guys. I, he's sitting on a stage. I'm not the stage. <laughs> on the rock. His hands are in the air like this. And he, can, I have some, can I have some help here? I'm going to ask my son and my daughter to help me. Come on. All right. This is Aaron, and this is actually a her. So I'm being biblical. So hold my hands up, guys. Hold my hands up. So now I can hold it up. So not, if, not that, that much. Okay. So now I'm like this, right? And I can relax my hands. And I am sitting. I am sitting on the promises of God and my blessed assurance. And, um, and I'm sitting here, and I am praying, and I can continue to do it because they're helping me out. Thank you, guys. That's enough. Oh. All right. Get, please thank my assistants. So what this is really all about is this. You're going to get tired. And do you have anyone to help encourage you in prayer? This is what's so wonderful about church is, uh, you know, you can come to church all you want, but we, we encourage you to get involved with small groups. That's why we have growth track today at 1 o'clock. If you have not gone, I encourage you to come. Catered meal, child care. We even wash and wax your car for you. Well, not, maybe not that, but uh, we have extra food and child care right after the service at 1 o'clock. And we have four steps to help you, an on-ramp, to get involved and get involved with small groups. Because you know what? Sometimes your hands get heavy, and you need someone to encourage you to keep your hands up. And when you sit on the Word of God and believe and rest on God and have other people watch what God will do, keep painting those targets, whatever it could be. Uh, a dear friend of our family, she has gone home with the Lord. Her name is uh, Joanne Lappard. She's with the Lord now. Her husband, Dick Lappard, is now a widower. But what happened was for 17, over 17 years, she prayed for her husband to come to know Jesus. You know what she did? She painted the target, and she stopped nagging him. She stopped asking him to go to church. She just prayed for him, and served, and was a blessing to him. I have uh, advice. Uh, nagging doesn't go too well. Men and women. Okay. You guys are really kind of a sedate crowd. Uh, get myself into trouble here. But anyhow, so this is what happened. And so she prayed for 17 years. She kept painting the target. And one day, he came to know Jesus Christ. They began a healing ministry together. They were married over 50 years. They have children, grandchildren. God worked powerfully through their lives, right? So do not give up. Continue to pray. Continue to pinpoint. So they took a stone. And Aaron and her held up his hands, one on each side. You need a someone and you need some friends. You need an Aaron and you need a her. And so the reason we have small groups, not just to have small groups, it's, it's just a catalyst, an opportunity to help you to find other people that you can go through life with, that you can have someone to hold your hands up. I thank God there's been some circumstances in my life. My wife's my best friend, hands down or hands up. <laughs> Anyhow, that was good. Anyhow, and she's fantastic, and she's going to help me. There are difficult times, and I have other friends I can call up and say, listen, I'm going through it. I need your help here. I don't know if I can do this anymore, but I'm going to continue to point that laser at that, and I got people helping me continue to pray. I'm resting on the Word of God. My hands are in the air, being held, and I'm praying. I'm painting that target, waiting for God to come on my behalf. So this was beginning to happen, okay? So his hands were steady. Why was his hand steady? Because of what? Because he had help, right? I have news for you. You need help. Everyone needs help. Everyone's got a problem. If you don't think you have a problem, you really have a problem. No, I don't. No, oh boy. Don't, don't raise your hand if you have no problems. Because we're throwing you out of the church. Just kidding. Okay. So his hands were steady until the going down of the sun, and Joshua overwhelmed Amalek and his people with the sword. So what is this all about? This is about do not give up on prayer, but God is not calling you to pray by yourself. He's asking you to have other people to encourage you, and you need to rest on the word of the Lord. Have the word, have the body, continue to raise your hands, and believe God for the best. God will answer your prayer. It might be yes, no, or my favorite, wait. And by the way, you may not get the answer to your prayer in your lifetime. You may be setting things up for next generations. 
We don't get that here in America. We just don't. In our Western mindset, we don't get it. Go over to Europe or go over to other countries where you see buildings that are 2,000 years old, they get it. Do you realize when Abraham, I'm reading through the Bible in a year, I love doing it, I encourage you to do it with us. Reading about Abraham, when Abraham died, God said, I'm going to make you a father of many nations. Guess how many children he had when he died? Eight. And eight is enough. So he had eight children. That's all he had. I'm sure people are saying, father of many nations. He's got eight kids. I got 16. All right. But now, thousands of years later, we're a result of his obedience to the Lord. Do you see that? So you, don't, you can't even judge your life. You don't know the impact you're going to have. So be faithful. Rest on his word. Lift your hands to him. And pray and believe and have people to help you lift your hands when you can't lift them yourself. So we are in a spiritual battle. I don't know if you recognize this. There are spiritual forces in high places. The Bible says very clearly in 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 4, the Apostle Paul reminds us, for though we walk in the flesh, that's in the natural, right? We're waging war according to... We're not waging war according to the flesh. We're in a warfare. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power. How many people need divine power? Absolutely. So if you're a soldier and you're on the battlefield and you're pointing that laser, you need divine, you need the airstrike to come, right? So many ways what you and I do, we're on the ground. God delegates us as ground troops. We point the laser at the target. We pray. God sends the Air Force and does his bidding. There are people that I know, they spend so much time, they're like soldiers saying, they try to con control all the aircraft up there. And, oh, I, I bind this, I bind that. Well, you try, you're trying to bind the devil. How about you go across the street and tell someone that Jesus loves them? So God has us in authority on the ground. So we call upon the Air Force, but we call upon God. But we point the laser and we pray, and we have other people join in prayer with us, and then God goes in it for us. So in many ways, the spiritual realm is like the Air Force. And we're stuck on the ground, all right? So though we wage war according to the flesh, for the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to what? Destroy strongholds. That's right. God wants us to destroy strongholds. Not put up with them, not deal with them, not, oh, I'll just, no. He wants us to destroy. What's a stronghold? A stronghold is a stronghold. A stronghold is something that you have a hard time breaking through. Maybe it's anger. Maybe it's fear. Maybe it's uh, uh, sexual uh, issues, maybe it's um, eating issues, I don't know, maybe it's, maybe it's just pride issues. Whatever it could be, you have issues that require tissues. And so what you need to do is you, thank you, what you need to do is continue to trust God and go after them and saying, God, I want this out. And sometimes you need somebody to help you out to see it happen. The Bible says, pray for one another that you may be healed. You see, God forgives, but God gives healing to the body. You need, we need each other, whether you like it or not. Okay, in Ephesians 6.12, it says the following. For we do not wrestle against your brother-in-law and the blood, but against what? Rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against spiritual forces of evil and the heavenly places. We could go on and, and dissect this. Basically, there's all sorts of spiritual realms that are out there. God is bigger. God is stronger, okay? But we are wrestling not against flesh and blood. That hostility at work is not, is not exactly the people at work. It, the hostility you see in the political realm is not just Donald Trump, the Democrats, Nancy Pelosi, Chuck Schumer. It's not just them. There are spiritual forces. If you don't think there's spiritual forces behind those people, there are spiritual forces behind those people. Okay, there's stuff going on. It's not just in the natural. That person you're trying to live with, that grandmother or mother-in-law or father-in-law or son-in-law, whoever you're struggling with, it is not just the natural. There's a spiritual component to it. Now, don't say, I bind you, Satan, to the, to the person. That doesn't work very well, by the way. But I encourage you to pray and realize it's beyond what I'm seeing here, okay? So, the reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. Jesus didn't walk around like this. Oh, Lord, blessed are poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. You know, I don't want to hurt anybody. No, he, that wasn't Jesus. Jesus was a very strong, powerful man. He willingly set down his life. But he's here to destroy the works of the enemy, and that's our job. How do we do it? Not by being arrogant, not by being jerks, but by pointing that laser, praying, and being blessing to other people. 
That's how we do that. So here's a couple truths. We are in a spiritual battle. Whether you like it or not, we're in a spiritual battle. We're at war. You can pretend all you want that we're not in war, but we're in war. How do we fight the battle? Well, we fight with persistent prayer. That's right. Persistent prayer. Don't give up. The word of God is very clear about this. Jesus says in Matthew 7, 7, ask, it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. The problem is, this is actually true, but the way it parses the Greek verbs is not accurate. Actually, for, for once, the New Living Translation actually gets it right. They actually break it down uh, in its verb form. They say this, present continuous action. It says, keep on asking, and you will receive what you ask for. Keep on seeking, and you will find. It means don't give up. Keep that laser pointed or whatever it could be. A love lost one, a situation, a family member, you don't know. Do you know something else is that your prayers go on even after you're gone? I'm, I, I, me being up here is a result of my grandparents praying for me. And God's still answering their prayers. God collects them. So do not give up on prayer. You keep those lasers pointed and you keep praying. You keep going. Keep on asking. Keep on seeking. Now when God says stop, you stop. There are some times you need to stop praying. Oh, God, bring him back, bring him back. God's like, uh-uh, he ain't come back, and you, believe me, you don't want him back. Let it go, okay? Like frozen, okay? Let it go. <laughs> so keep on asking, and you will receive what you ask for. Keep on seeking, and you will find. Keep on knocking. And the, you see what Jesus is saying? He's trying to get across to us, don't give up. Keep praying, keep knocking, keep asking, and we open to you for everyone. Look at your neighbor. You're in everyone. Thank you. You're in everyone who asks, receives. Everyone who seeks, finds. And everyone who knocks, the door will be open. Yes, no, wait. God will answer our prayers. Don't give up. Keep praying. Keep that laser pointed. Have friends to hold your hands up. Sit on the promises of God. Move forward. Don't give up. Don't give up. You see, the whole problem, the, the, the context of this is this. Your parents, if your children ask for a loaf of bread, do you give them a stone instead? So what he's basically saying, if you being unperfect parents, I'm the perfect father, and I will answer your prayers, but don't give up. It's always that extra push. Sometimes you're sitting there, I, I can't do it, I can't do it. If you're sitting at the gym and you're trying to bench press 250 and you're on your last rep, oh, I can't do it. What do you have next to you? You have something called what? A spotter. As you can tell, I go to the gym. So, um, so this, what does a spotter do? The spotter usually yells at you. Come on, you can push it. Come on, come on, come on, push. I can't, I can't, I can't. So as you cannot do it, the spotter would just kind of give you a little bit, maybe take five pounds off and just give you a little bit. Come on. And the spotter will help you to push that extra rep to do it. And sometimes you need a spotter. Do you have a spotter? They tell you not to do free weights without a spotter. Okay? Very important. So, so this is part of the issues here. God loves you, everybody, and he's for you. If you're alive today, he's for you. If, if, if he wasn't for you, you'd be dead. There is an opportunity for you to give your life to Christ, to live a life that's worth living. It doesn't make a difference what your past was. God can take your shame. If you're willing to drop your shame, God can make it his gain in your life. And God wants us to be a people that are laser focused on prayer. That we point at it, we say, God, I've done all I can do. I'm going to continue to pray and ask for your blessing. I'm going to sit on your word. i got my friends joining me. Let's go forward in this new year. Well, how do we do that? Well, we fight persistent prayer, and we fight with unity in community. Unity in community. It's very important. The Bible says this, and this is not Lucy. You know who Lucy is. Don't mess with Lucy. This is what Lucy says. Lucy says, you know, she told Charlie Brown one time, Charlie Brown, in my hand I have five fingers. By themselves they mean nothing. But when I clench them as a fist, it's a mighty force. And so when you fight, you don't fight like this. You fight like this. All right? In unity is power. God gives us. There's power in unity in community. It's behold, how good and pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in what? Unity. For there the Lord commands the blessing. God commands blessing on your life when you're in unity with other people going after God. Okay, unity works. It happens even in the corporate world. You can see these companies consolidating. Um, Disney's eating up everybody, right? They bought everything. 
And so they have great power because they're consolidating. There's unity. There's great unity when the body of Christ comes together and goes after the same thing. So God commands his blessing in unity. That's why you need people that can help you fight for the right thing. If you have people that are counterproductive to your life, if you're praying to be godly and your friends are dragging you a different direction, guess what? It's time to find new friends and call them and say, what are you doing tomorrow night? I'm busy. What are you doing? Not spending it with you. You need to get the right people around you because uh, I'm telling you right now, spiritual, spirituality is communicable. It affects you. Get around the right people. Get away from the wrong people. If you cannot influence someone else, then you need to get away from them. If you cannot influence them the right way. So, dwell together in unity. For there the Lord commands his blessing. So we fight with unity in community. Finally, prayer with fasting. I want to quickly go through this with you. Not long. So he said to them, this is Jesus. This can only come out by nothing but prayer and fasting. How many of you gained a lot of weight over the holidays? There's a reason I'm wearing the vest. I'm just kidding. But... If fasting is not a diet, okay? Fasting is different. Fasting is throughout Scripture. Moses fasted 40 days and 40 nights, and then he got the, the Ten Commandments, right? Jesus fasted 40 days before he started his ministry. Elijah fasted. We can see fasting throughout Scripture, and the Bible talks about it. We have something called 21 days. Beginning today, it comes from the book of Daniel. Daniel fasted 21 days. First it was 10 days, and it was 21 days. That's what we're doing Tomorrow morning at 6 a.m. we'll be here live. Okay, 21 days, January 12th to February 1st. What's it all about? But seek what? First, the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added. We want to encourage you to put God first. We want to encourage you to get your laser beams out, and let's begin to fire at least one or two things in your life you want to see changed by the kingdom of God and get somebody else to come in agreement with you, whatever it could be, okay? There are different types of fasts. A complete fast means pretty much you eat nothing, just water. I don't recommend that unless you have a doctor's thing, but um, just water and all you do, it's not as hard as you think. I, I did it for two, 20 minutes. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm just kidding. Just kidding. But <laughs> thank you. I really appreciate all the encouragement from you. Um, but it, it's just water and just juices and you don't have anything else to think. Okay, that's complete fast. Then you have something called selective fast. And what that would be was like, for example, I'm going to select a certain types of food. I'm going to go on Daniel fast, for example. No meats, no sweets, no breads, just fruits and vegetables and bird food. That's it. Okay? And so you do that. And why do you do that for? You do it to discipline the body, which I'll share, a few, share with you in a few moments what that means. It's a reminder, a vivid reminder that I am in prayer, selective fast. Also a partial fast. Maybe you do just the mornings, or maybe you fast lunch and dinner and eat lunch, or maybe you, do have, you fast Mondays. Whatever it can do. Whatever works. And perhaps the biggest and the most difficult fast is this one. Soul fast. Not soul food, but soul fast. What's soul fast? Soul fast is media. Ha ha ha. Okay. Some of us, we, I, I'm convinced if evolution is true, we'd have square heads in about 100 years from looking at our phones. But uh, what would happen if we put our, put our phones away and got rid of, uh, for old people, we got rid of Facebook? And if you ask a young person to get rid of Facebook, I don't care. How about Instagram? No! And you can't touch through Instagram. Okay, Instagram, Snapchat, I don't know what else is out. But how about this? What would happen if we put our social media away for 21 days? How about we get rid of YouTube? Oh, no. For 21 days. No entertainment for 21 days. And I'm going to spend that time, that 12 hours a day on the phone, I'm going to spend, <laughs> I'm going to spend with the Lord. And how about not spend that time? Maybe do that. Okay, maybe food, whatever it can be. But I want to encourage you to do something. Do something different. If you want to change what you're doing, you got to do something different. If you want to break something, if you want to change, you got to break something. you got to break a pattern. I want to encourage you to do that. That's what's going on. Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. Why? The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. So what we're doing is we're trying to strengthen our spirit while we lessen the physical man. You see, whatever you feed thrives, whatever you starve dies. So why not just take this opportunity to get our focus right, to get our laser pointed, and I want to encourage you, you make your own choice, it's up to you, Okay, and just take these 21 days, social media, food, whatever it could be, and let's stay focused. 
Let's tell somebody else what we're doing, and let's watch God do miracles in our midst. Amen? So I want to encourage you that today, okay? Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. Father, I just want to thank you today, and I ask that, Lord, all of us have areas of our lives where we would love to see changed. Lord, some of us have areas we've been praying for you, to you for years, and we've given up. I've tried, and I've tried, and I've failed, and I've failed. There's no use. It's just what I am. Father, we want to believe you. We know your word is true. Lord, we want to point the laser of our prayer and say, God, I need your help. We want to raise our hands to you, and we're asking God that you get us in community, that we will be able to encourage each other as we sit on your word, as we rest upon your word, Lord, we're asking for deliverance, God. I pray, Lord, that we would see strongholds broken. I pray for relationships to be healed, addictions to be broken. Father God, um, have habits and patterns that are not good. Lord, we're praying that you would move powerfully among us in these 21 days as we calibrate our lives for 2020. In Jesus' name, with every.